Good afternoon, I'm Rob McCammon, the Director of Product Management for Cleversafe, and I'd like to talk to you about how one of our customers is using their Cleversafe DSNet to deliver uh, a range of IT services internal to their company. So, this um, organization had the following market requirements. They have, uh, they're part of a very big company. Uh, so, in their role as the IT organization, they're called upon to provide uh, a lot of different services. And many of those services are fairly storage intensive. So they were looking for a better way to meet the storage requirements, a way to share storage across multiple applications, uh, delivering different services to different customers, uh, having excellent scalability, excellent quality of service that they can deliver to their customers, keeping the different applications and users uh, appropriately separated from one another while sharing the storage resources. Uh, scalability is key because the aggregation of the total amount of data associated across all these services um, in all these different uh, use cases can eventually be uh, hundreds of petabytes, uh, if not exabytes in size. And they're uh, providing services 24 seven. So no, uh, no service unavailable situations as a result of the storage are acceptable. So, um, what they're doing is they're taking advantage of uh, a number of different uh, alliance partners that Cleversafe has developed integrations with for different um, use cases. They're using the Panzura gateways to store audio call recordings. So if someone calls their customer service department, uh, they want to record that interaction and, and store that. Uh, the application relies on uh, SIFs to do so. So it uses the Panzura gateway to then store that data to the DSNet. On the same DSNet in another vault, which is the logical container that you create on the DSNet, they're using uh, Symantec Net Backup to uh, back up one of their organization's uh, data that was previously going to digital tape. Um, another application for the uh, Panzura gateway is as an interface to use the DSNet as an, an origin video store. So keeping uh, TV programs and movies, uh, transcoded content stored in the DSNet and pulling it out of the DSNet when they need to deliver it to uh, subscribers on their network. And then using uh, Satera's product to provide a different organization in their company with uh, an enterprise class Dropbox-like uh, Feature so they're they're implementing uh, internal, multi tenants, multiple services, um, and have plans to add several more services uh, over time. This is kind of just the first wave of their service deployments on this shared DS net. Um, to do this, they're actually using several different uh, methods of interfacing to the DS net. They're using our Amazon S3 compatible RESTful interface. Uh, when they're using the Panzura gateways. Uh, they're using a Symantec connector developed to utilize the um, native RESTful interface of the DSNet. They uh, are also mm -hmm. using that native RESTful interface in their integration with the Satera product. And in the future, they expect to use uh, our OpenStack Swift compatible API, which is a, a new feature of our product and also our Hadoop distributed file system compatible uh, API for new, new applications and new use cases. So, I mean, would all, was all that one central data vault, if that's the right term? It's, it's, it's multiple vaults, so there's a separate logical container for each of these services, okay. but it's all on the same physical set of storage nodes and going through the same physical set of access or appliances. The attribute of threshold and all that stuff is on a vault basis? On a vault basis, right. So I don't know if they do, but they certainly could have different widths and thresholds for these different applications. Did you say future OpenStack Swift integration or current? Current. Okay. Yeah, new. <laughs> a new feature. So, um, and I just wanted to further explain that at, at the most direct uh, interaction with our dispersed storage system, we really support two native uh, paradigms for storage. We call them named object and simple object. 
The difference is really, uh, if you use the simple object interface, you're gonna give us some data to store, we're gonna store it, we're gonna give you an object ID back that you can use to refer to that data. You're gonna keep that object ID with your application and use it to ask for the data later. Uh, in the named object paradigm, you're gonna give us an object, you're gonna tell us what its name is, we're gonna store that object, there's gonna be an object ID associated with it, just like in the first case that we're gonna to need to read the data back, but we're gonna actually create a metadata database that we store in a dispersed way on our storage network that tells us which name goes with which object ID. So when you ask for that object later, just using its name, we can look up the object ID and then retrieve the object uh, using the object ID. And on top of that named object interface, we're able to build uh, HDFS compatibility, Amazon S3 compatibility, uh, OpenStack Swift compatibility. And on top of those interfaces, then we're enable, able to enable you know, a number of different uh, technology partners. So again, this is not an exhaustive set of all the uh, integrations that we've uh, worked through with different alliance partners, but you see some that we haven't uh, mentioned up to this point. So GladNet is like SharePoint. Sorry? Exciting ones like SharePoint. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what someone might get excited about. So you see some uh, you know, kind of uh, desktop client storage locker type services like GladNet and WebDrive. Uh, Brevity is a audio, uh, or sorry, a video processing uh, flow tool. Uh, backup from Commvault and Symantec. QSTAR is a archival storage gateway. Uh, SharePoint, we know what that is. Riverbed, that's a, another gateway. These gateways are obviously very important to customers that want to get the benefits of object storage without rewriting applications to talk an object storage protocol mm -hmm. directly. There are many different uh, types of gateways out there with different characteristics. So depending on what your application is, you would likely prefer one over another. Um, so now I just want to talk a little bit about this idea of zero downtime upgrade. How do we do it? And then we're going to have uh, Mike Burby, he's on the phone, kind of show you a, a real-time demonstration of zero town, downtime upgrade in Basis. This is really something that we're able to do uh, because of the erasure coding basis of our system. So when we want to upgrade uh, someone's DSNet to a new version of software, the first thing we do is we get the image that represents the new version of software, the upgrade. We put it on this manager appliance. In each DSNet, there's one manager appliance that's used for performance monitoring, uh, health monitoring of the hardware, uh, and it orchestrates this uh, upgrade process. Then the manager will be upgraded to the new version of software. So I'm just gonna talk about version one and version two to keep this simple. My whole DSNet was at version one. After this, my manager's running version two, everything else is running version one, that's fine. You could leave it in that state for a while, it would work with, without any problems. Um, then you start upgrading your slice store nodes. And what you do is you um, upgrade one or a couple at a time, always keeping more than a width or more than a threshold number of slice stores online. So let's see, in this example, how many do I got down there? Two, four, six, eight. I got 12, so let's say this is my uh, example system with uh, a width of 12, so I'm creating 12 slices of all data. I need seven slices to read that data back. If I take these two slice stores out of the pool temporarily to upgrade them, I still have 10 slice stores with data to provide the seven slices that I need. And we limit the number that you can do in parallel to ensure that you never get close uh, to not being able to read the data, even accounting for the possibility that you might not have a 100% healthy system at a given point in time as I have here. So you upgrade the slice stores two at a time in this example, and then when they're done, you up, up, upgrade the accessors again, taking one out of the pool to upgrade it, leaving the others active so you can continue to offer uh, service availability, and uh, eventually you're done upgrading your whole system. We've also had customers use this property to physically move uh, part of their DSNet to a new data center. So they'll shut down you know, a node and ship it across the country or across town, plug it onto the network, bring it back up. Shut down another node, uh, do the same thing. We have multiple customers that have been able to move equipment from one data center to another 
without ever turning their storage service uh, off, using, really using that same property. Rob, do you need an accessor node in every location? You don't need an accessor node in every location. Sometimes the accessors uh, are not in the same location as the slice store. Depending on uh, exactly what you're trying to do, it can either be better to have the accessors where the slice stores are, or if the, uh, let's say you have application servers that are doing the writing to the slice stores that are located in another data center, you might choose to put the accessors uh, in that location. There's also a method of deployment where instead of deploying physical accessors, we provide the accessor function as a Java library that you can link with your application. Then you have no physical accessor appliances at all, and wherever your application runs, uh, it's going as far as creating the slices and then talking directly to the, the slice stores. So there's quite a few different configuration options that are, that are possible. So, what this customer then got um, as a result of deploying their uh, shared storage infrastructure for their different IT services was better utilization of the storage uh, that they were purchasing because they can physically share it while using it in a logically separated way um, to support these different applications and different services. They just have to manage one storage infrastructure, not one for backup, one for audio call recording, one for enterprise Dropbox, and they can tailor the characteristics of that storage uh, by changing the, the parameters of the vaults that they use, the logical containers for each service, to give them the access control that they want to apply to that data, the level of reliability that they want. Um, they can also um, use different categories of slice stored devices in their DSNet to create storage pools within their overall infrastructure that have different price performance characteristics. <laughs> 